Hello everyone, welcome to Hangout with CERN. I am Freya Blackman and today we're actually joined by a lot of experts from the LHC and from three of its experiments, uh, Alice, Atlas and CMS, to talk about the ongoing proton LED run. Uh, we will first show you some uh, uh, nice LED proton uh, collision events to uh, get started. And uh, uh, so let's do that first. And uh, meanwhile, I will chat a bit more uh, about uh, what we're going to be doing today. So last week, we actually had quite a nice discussion about, uh, about these LED ion runs. And we think that there were so many questions there that we're, today we're going to focus mostly on questions. So we'll keep the introduction short and keep the questions coming, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. So um, before we do that, I uh, propose that we first go to uh, Steve, who will remind us a bit more of what we heard last week. Steve, please go ahead. Hi, Steve. Hello, everybody. If you guys were here last week, or if you weren't here last week, let me give you a quick recap. What we learned was that at CERN in the LHC, which was designed to collide protons together and to, to collide lead ions together, we're now doing something that wasn't on the program, and that's colliding protons with lead ions. Why are we doing this? We found out, our theorist friends, that it's interesting to do this. We learn some things. In particular, when you take a smaller particle and smash it into a bigger particle, you learn about the structure of that bigger particle, and that's something very interesting to know. We use lead ions because we want to really go back in time and to see what, what the universe was like at the very instant just after the Big Bang, back when quarks and gluons were living together and they weren't yet forming protons and neutrons. It's a very interesting realm to try to understand and to learn about, and so we're probing that. And this is a way to do it. Uh, the experimentalists are very excited. Our experts on the LHC did an amazing thing because protons are 200 times smaller than lead ions, so it's really hard to get them going at the energies you want and to get them to collide when you want. So that's what we learned. Now we're going to hear from the experts what we're learning from it now. Yeah, exactly. Hey, thanks a lot, Steve. Um, before we start doing that, though, of course, we have a nice trivia question every week. So this time, uh, Ken will ask the question. Uh, Ken, how are you doing? And uh, hey, give us hi, a question. Hey, how are you? Good morning. OK. So you may have heard on Twitter that about five days ago, high-energy physicists celebrated the anniversary of a very important fundamental particle 30 years ago, this 30th anniversary. Let's hear a little bit more. Our trivia question is, here's the question. What two famous physicists were awarded the Nobel Prize for this fundamental particle and when? What two physicists and when? were awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of this important particle that we just celebrated the anniversary of. Okay, back to you, Freya. Thanks a lot, Steve. How did so, they answer you? How did they answer you, Ken? Oh, great. Great question, Steve. Okay, so they can post their question with the tag ask, hashtag AskCern on Twitter, or maybe the easiest way is just put your comments right on the live YouTube feed, or you can even put them on the Google Plus event invitation in that order. Okay, back to you, Freya. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> so last, well, yeah, before we dive in, we do have some nice things to show. So we have a lot of different people here today, and I want to introduce them. So um, we have some special guests, and um, I would, but before we introduce them, I would like to introduce the physicists. So let's start with, uh, with the physicists uh, who are actually giving us these wonderful collisions, which is Detlef and Django. Hi, guys. Say hi. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> and uh, then, and then, and then we have, uh, of course, we have some people from the Atlas experiment. So that's Peter Steinberg. Peter, are you still here? Hi, I'm Peter. Hi. I'm still here. Peter Steinberg from Brookhaven National Lab. I, I represent the Atlas experiment here. Hi. And uh, then there are three people, actually, in the CMS co uh, remote control room. Uh, why don't you guys introduce yourself? Hi. I'm Yuan Ji Li, uh, and a CERN fellow, and I'm uh, working on CNS uh, experiment. And there are a lot of people out here uh, also working on CNS. And uh, hi, I'm Ye Kin uh, from MIT. I'm Jan Fiete, and actually I'm an alien here because I'm from the Alice experiment and uh, just here for the live stream. Welcome. 
Hi, uh, I'm Arjun and I'm from India. I'm a final year CS student. Uh, so I'm here for the live stream. Hi, Arjun. It's great that you can join us, by the way. So uh, welcome. And the last guest. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, I hope you, uh, you will get to have a chance to ask some nice questions. So, uh, and the last person, our last guest. It's Nick, right, Nick? <laughs> uh, maybe Nick is muted. Let's continue. <laughs> and uh, so, um, as we try to ask, ask as many questions, and because I want to make this look like an authentic physics meeting, I've actually made a very high tech sign. So, just so you see, here it is. Uh, this is how uh, us particle physicists let people know that they only have one minute to talk. So, one minute. <laughs> so, um, and, um, but let's first start with um, what is going on at the moment uh, in the LHC control, uh, control room, the, the CERN control center where the LHC is driven and we should hear something from our experts there. Go ahead, guys. Okay, I start because um, I'm an source physicist, so I prepare and start the acceleration of all the primary particles used everywhere at CERN. So we have a proton source, it's a dual plasmatron, connected to uh, LINAC2, linear accelerator for protons. Uh, the dual plasmatron is, uh, is an arc discharge, and we create the protons from hydrogen gas. For the heavy ions, we have an uh, electron cyclotron resonance source, it's a plasma source. Um, this is connected to LINAC-3, our, uh, our LINAC for heavy ions. And there we create the lead ions from metal lead, enriched metallic lead, which uh, costs such a bottle here, five grams of lead, around six to seven thousand dollars. And uh, the source, uh, ah, there's a bottle. Um, it's a plasma source, so that uh, the lead is evaporated in an oven, and uh, in the plasma it's ionized, extracted, and then accelerated. And from both Linux, we hand it over then to the accelerator chain, going through the different accelerators up to the HC. Yeah, and this is uh, where uh, we take over. So from the proton Linux, the uh, the protons go into uh, four rings of a small synchrotron, the booster. They are accelerated there, transmitted to the PS, which chops these uh, bunches from the LINAC, uh, from the from the LINAC and from the booster into smaller bunches with the proper spacing for LHC collisions. The um, the bunches are accelerated in the PS and transferred to the SPS, which accelerates them to the injection energy of the LHC, 450 GeV. Once the LHC has been filled with protons, we then fill it with heavy ions. So we take then the heavy ions from the other LINAC, inject them into the LIA machine, which accumulates them, makes a very dense beam, thanks to electron cooling. And these bunches, again, are sent into the PS, where uh, they are arranged in order to have the proper spacing for the LHC collisions. The PS accelerates them, transfers them to the SPS, and the SPS transfers them to the LHC in the other ring, in ring two for the moment. Then the LHC takes over, and this was already covered last week. Yeah. Oh, that's a wonderful. Thank you, guys. So these protons and uh, lead ions that we then get, and if we once they are circulating in the uh, LHC, we collide them uh, at uh, inside our enormous detectors. And I think that this is a time to actually have a short, disc uh, short introduction of the people who actually study these collisions. Now, I also work at an experiment, but I don't look at heavy ion collisions, so I'm just as much of a non-expert as most of the people who are actually listening to this uh, feed or looking now. So, so uh, I hope I will learn something as well, actually. So why don't we start? I, the previous time I uh, uh, gave Peter the first word, so I propose that we now first go to the CMS Center.
Okay, so I, I'm working on uh, CNS. Uh, so basically, we uh, CNS is a high performance uh, detector which can be used for the discovery of the Higgs boson. And uh, now this time we use it for uh, heavy ion uh, collision studies. And I, I myself, I is particularly interested in and jet and the photon production in those uh, heavy ion uh, events. And uh, we we are looking at the jet quenching or in that that collision, and we want to see anything will happen uh, in, in the collision, something like that. And uh, this is also my colleague, Ye King. Oh, yeah. Ye King can Hi. Um, yeah, so um, as Yenji described, we are here because we find these collisions interesting. And uh, every uh, year, uh, mostly in the winter time, we get together in this room for one month when the LHC is circulating ions instead of uh, protons. Uh, and that's the time we really uh, work hard to uh, collect this data and study it. And um, this year, it's not ion and ion uh, collisions, but rather proton ion. But uh, the whole thing is uh, just has the um, same, uh, well, similar interesting uh, features. The, it's all parts of a big uh, physics program. And uh, I guess we will get a chance to talk about more detailed things, but uh, let's just. Yeah, so a few words about Alice. So as I said before, these guys are from CMS. So in principle, we're always on competition. They just invited me today to the uh, control room here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Alice is a dedicated heavy ion experiment. We also look at proton ion collisions. Um, and um, in particular, compared to the others, we uh, are particularly good to dis distinguish different kinds of particles, so to find out if it's a proton, if it's a kaon, uh, if it's a pion, and other types of particles. And um, that is uh, one of the main things. The other is that we look in the direction of the beam and forward direction. But uh, I guess we will uh, go through one or two things and then discuss in details when it comes to your questions, guys. Exactly. So that was a very nice introduction already. So we have some idea of what you guys do. I propose we now really go to the physics introduction. Uh, introduction. Peter, would you like to uh, tell us a bit more about what we're trying to do physics-wise with this run? Oh, physics-wise, it's a fascinating run. In heavy ion collisions, we have been finding quite a few interesting phenomena. As mentioned, this, this phenomenon of jet quenching, which we had seen very early in the heavy ion run. And we've seen, we've seen the suppression of various particles, all of which related to the dynamics and sort of, of the hot, dense soup, this quark and plasma that we think we're creating in heavy ion collision. The proton lead run is a really unique opportunity where we're actually now taking something very small, which is a proton. We're colliding with something very large, which is an ion. And we're really trying to learn both whether or not um, there's something interesting about the, the structure of the nucleus itself relative to the structure of the proton, which helps lead to some of these effects. There's some suspicion that the, the, the nuclear structure itself, especially the, 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 the quark and gluon structure, is very important for this. But we're also trying to look for interesting novel effects simply from, from producing these interesting systems from proton and nucleus collisions. And so th th it's really quite an interesting broad program, and it's really an exciting opportunity that many of us didn't expect we'd ever get um, in the early days of the heavy ion program. That's uh, really cool. Yeah, no, sorry, I was muted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to make sure there's not too much noise. So, um, have we found anything so far? In the proton lead program, we actually have found something very interesting. This is something where, while we were expecting to look for very high momentum particles, um, like w which, which manifest themselves as these jets, which we've seen are, which, as suppressed in heavy ion collisions, in the very low momentum particles, we've actually seen th this novel structure, which is called the ridge which is something where, where particles that are produced in our detectors, if we look very, very far away at very, very forward angles relative to these particles, we see that almost, for essentially almost every particle we produce, there's a, a substantial fracture of the time, a particle very far away from it, and, and, but, but which is, which is in, in a structure which we had really never seen before. The, the, closest, um, the closest comparison we'd, we'd ever seen was rela related, I, strangely enough, to the, the strange fluid behavior which we see in heavy ion collisions. We, find that we, we make this perfect liquid. But there are also explanations for this phenomenon in terms of these very, very um, exotic um, QCD effects, which are related to very high density effects. And so right now, uh, this so-called ridge effect, which has now been seen by all of the experiments, is under intense scrutiny. And we expect the high statistics which we get in this run to really bear on exactly what mechanism is causing this. But really, we're all uh, bracing ourselves for, to, to see what happens. 
Thanks a lot, Peter. So actually, uh, in your description, there are already some things that make me think for a bit what it was again. So I'm sure there will be many questions on social media. And I would say, let's now start taking those questions. So keep them coming. Type them into Twitter. Type them into Google+. Type them into the YouTube feed. Uh, Ken, who is monitoring these, and he will uh, give us selected questions. But I propose we first get a question, actually, from, uh, from one of our guests. Uh, and uh, are you? Would you? Do you have? You have a question, right? So go ahead. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah. So my question is, uh, how do you get the idea of proton-lead collisions come into being? I mean, what was the driving factor behind uh, the experiment? Uh, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, why don't we ask, actually, would the person to answer that best uh, might be Peter again. Um, I'm, I'm happy to field that. Um, proton lead collisions have actually been um, something which have been discussed since the very, very early discussions of the heavy ion program. At RIC, um, actually, literally 10 years ago, right now, if I remember correctly, there was a big announcement at RIC um, related, also related to jet quenching which was based on deuteron gold collisions, which are not very they're not dissimilar to proton lead. The deuteron is a is a, a proton neutron bound state. It was the, the thing that Rick was able to collide instead of protons. The idea being here that the pro, the deuteron gold collisions were a control experiment for the jet quenching, which had been seen in gold gold collisions. So in the in the same vein, people really wanted to try proton lead collisions to in order to compare with the lead lead collisions mainly to rule out just in case if something funny was going on with the nucleus that, that might actually have led to the, this jet quenching effect. So it, at the very least, it, is, it was always thought to be um, a useful control measurement. On the other hand, the more we look, for instance, with this ridge phenomenon, proton lead collisions are turning out to be very, very interesting in their own right and actually very exciting. Um, there are somewhere in between a proton-proton collision and a lead-lead collision um, in a way which is also incredibly well suited to the detectors. Um, Heavy ion collisions are, can be somewhat challenging for these detectors, while proton lead is really in a sweet spot where we can really do an, an amazing things with the LHC detectors to study these. So to summarize, okay, it started you, out as a cross-check, but uh, we actually can do all sorts of really interesting st things as well, and our detectors almost work better that way. Precisely. I wouldn't say they work better, but, but, but they work a lot closer to the, to the optimal performance they get in proton-proton collisions. So what you so, can imagine is if you collide such a huge nucleus and another huge nucleus and you see something very spectacular, you ask yourself, well, is it due to the fact that you have a nucleus just on one side or that you have two colliding and something magical happens between them, some new state of matter or something is great. And that's why the idea came up to put a very small object on a big object. And if you want to know more about that, it was the hangout from last week with mouse, mouse smashes mammoth or the other way around and you can check it up there. Very good. We yeah, always like to uh, advertise our uh, <laughs> our yeah. different uh, previous hangouts. So take a look there, guys. It's of course on YouTube. Um, I propose we now take a question from the social media. Ken. Okay. Hey, Freya. Yeah, we've got a deep one. Okay, everybody, put on your thinking cap on YouTube. Alexander the Optimist says he gets the idea of the ridge, but think hard. Could you find a manifestation of the ridge effect somewhere else in the universe. Where, where beyond the LHC might aspects of the ridge effect possibly arise in other situations? That's Alexander the Optimist on YouTube. So, I mean, what LHC does, we have, uh, we have in principle everywhere in nature all the time. So there are particles coming out of space, hitting the Earth, cosmic rays we call them and of course they hit all other planets as well and sometimes you might have a cosmic ray just in space and nowhere hit another cosmic ray and if somebody would build up a huge detector there the same effect would also occur there so it's not limited to here it's really a fundamental thing of nature a lot of cosmic rays actually hitting ions so not only yeah. so, so they are actually there are uh, ion collisions everywhere uh, every day every time yeah. But uh, it's just a matter of uh, central mass energy, how bad than those uh, collisions is. Yes. So, in fact, oh, sorry, I can interject a bit later. Um, I, I think the question was in particular about the ridge effect, right? 
I, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. So not necessarily, it? folks. It yeah. could be, in a larger sense, it could be about correlation phenomena in physics. I, I you know, you can say I believe it's an open-ended question yeah. concerning correlations in different systems. So I think the interesting thing is that, like this, the the some phenomena in the heavy ion collisions was observed, which was interpreted as some hydrodynamic flow, which started making us imagining of this matter to be acting like a liquid and uh, this matter also teaches us about the uh, behavior of the material in, in the uh, early times of the universe and we are now starting to uh, get hints of how that matter behaved but uh, now the, if we see some different aspects of the correlations if we see it in different types of environment this can as well uh, challenge the ideas of the hydrodynamic flow and that would be also interesting and it would be also teaching us about uh, what was going on in the early universe. Wow, yeah that's quite a lot of information, very interesting actually, so uh, really cool, thanks guys. I think it's time for another question now from one of our special guests. Nick, uh, you were just muted before because you were having problems with your sound, shall we try again? Yeah, can you hear me this time? We can hear you and we can hear a vacuum cleaner or something like that. Uh, so ask your question think, and then you. <laughs> I think it's the fan on my uh, laptop. Um, in last year's proton-led ion run, the CMS observed particles moving in correlated directions. In the current run, has any further detail been observed to confirm this is color glass condensate occurring? Ooh, that's a very deep one. Um, well, as it's a CMS question, I uh, I propose that uh, one of our CMS friends answers it. So. Yeah, I, I think as soon as kind of we have uh, uh, found a correlated particle production, so those particles somehow knows each knows each other in some way. Okay, but uh, we we haven't uh, concluded uh, what kind of uh, mechanism is. Uh, the source of this kind of correlation. So I, I think uh, a lot more uh, activities are going, and uh, we also have this nice new data we just took, and a lot of people are really working very hard to figure out what can we learn from this new data. So I, I would say this answer is not, we haven't uh, have the final answer, but we know we know that there's a new phenomenon. It's very exciting, and we are working on it. And then also, what we have seen, in addition to the PP ridge that we've seen, uh, is that we have now two ridges. We have one on the near side, like it was in PP, and we have one on the away side as well. So maybe that's something that was also is also there in PP. It hasn't been seen there yet, but in PA we have uh, found this phenomena. So that's definitely new information, and that is something, as you asked, might challenge the color glass condensate guys. Okay, well, so that's a, that's a, a nice answer. So, there, um, do, Nick, are you happy with that? Uh, do you have a further question? No, that was a good answer. Thank you. Ah, wonderful. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, in that case, I propose we take another question from the social media, um, oh. where I'm sure there's many questions. Ken, tell okay, us. Okay, yeah. You know, it's really a live conversation. and, and uh, Alexander the Optimist has already written back, thanks for answering my question, that's the answer I wanted. And then we got another follow-on question on YouTube from Michael Coyle on YouTube wonders, okay, I'm in. Where can I find out more about the Ridge? Where can our YouTube viewers find out at a deeper level more about the Ridge? Where should we go? Good question. More Ridge questions, so I guess that's... Uh, so if you have uh, any particular yeah. questions... No, they, yeah, what, what websites, yeah, direct them to where to go. Yeah. I mean, you have the experts here, then there is a lot of stuff on the MIT website, uh, the press release, and uh, discussing some of the details. And of course, all the papers that discuss this are actually available uh, open access. So you don't have to be a member of CERN or one of the experiments to actually read about that. Of course, for that, you have to go a bit into the details. There are physics papers. Um, look at the CERN page, look at the CMS page, and the ALICE page, and you find more information about that. And I would be remiss not to mention the Brookhaven Theory Group is, di is a, a major contributor to the, the color glass condensate approach to this. <laughs> They've been putting out um, actually interviews um, and, and a lot of information on the Ridge and the Brookhaven website recently. So it's, it's really quite a hot topic on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, I, I would propose something. Uh, our director, Achintia, has set up a web page 
at, uh, let, me, let me hope I get this right, CERN.ch slash hangout. Is that right? Hangout? CERN.ch slash hangout. That's right. What we'll do is we can put on there any links uh, so for you guys to use. We'll get those up shortly so that you can follow those to, to other information. It's a really good idea. Yeah, that's a very good idea, Steve. Actually, one thing that is uh, also important to know is that next month, the monthly CERN uh, uh, publication, where we have a magazine at CERN called the CERN Courier, um, actually also will spend a lot of time on this. And that is public as well, so uh, everyone can take a look there. Um, there was one more question from Arjun. I know he had another question. And then we'll go back to some more social media questions. So. Uh, Arjun. Uh, I'm sorry, oh. I was typing. Was that for yeah. was that for me, Freya? I'm sorry. No, 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 that's all right. It was the first question so, yeah, for Arjun. Michael. Go ahead, Arjun. And then it's you, Ken. I think we're having troubles with this connection. Okay, I so think so too. In that case, let's take another social media question. Ken, I am sure you have many. Go ahead. Okay. I, I'm not sure who this is for, so I don't know how to direct it. Enrico Kip on YouTube wants to know about a different aspect to the process here. Okay. If one wanted to do this cool PA experiment, who would be credited for proposing the idea to run PA? How do you proceed with a proposal like that? And then who makes the decision, OK, we're going to run PA? Over to you guys. That is a good question. I think at least one side of the can already be answered by us, our friends in the CERN control room, right? Well, uh, the, the decision to, to, to do it is, uh, is not uh, made by us at all. We, we do it if we ask to, and then we we'll provide the, the ways. But at some point in the process, we are asked whether it is possible to, uh, to do. And then we are asked uh, how to do it, uh, what, uh, what, what it would mean for the, the rest of the physics program, what uh, kind of um, um, upgrades we would need to, to do to the uh, existing accelerators, how much time it would uh, take us to, to prepare the, the different beams. So in principle, the, the, the heavy iron source is a multipurpose source. There we can create, in principle, any type of beam from hydrogen to uranium. But it has to be studied and also then to transport it into different machines. That's very interesting. I didn't know that at all. So I guess that means that there's then a discussion between the experiments, actually. And then after that, we talk to, prop to uh, we, uh, get, have a discussion amongst each other, decide how much time we want to spend on what. Uh, Peter, um, do you have any experience with that? Uh, I don't have the experience of the high-level discussions, but yes, this was one of those one of those things that came up. It, was, it had been discussed for years. People have been discussed doing this for as long as I've ever been um, been involved in the heavy ion program, which is eight or nine years now. Um, but there really was there was a, a moment a couple of years ago when it became very clear that the machine was able to do it and really was exploring the, doing the studies to really make sure this year it ran well. When when it became clearer to everybody that the machine could do it. Then there was a lot of push from the experiments. I think all of the experiments um, were, well, were well aligned once the opportunity became available that we all really, really wanted to do it because the opportunity um, was just too good to pass up. I think the big surprise, at least for someone like me, who, 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 um, from relative, I'm not at the management level, was, that, was, was how soon it came. I think a lot of people expected it to come much later in the program, but, but the machine people did an incredible job of, of preparing this and, showing, and demonstrating that the machine could do it. Um, and they, they were even doing studies a year ago to get ready for it. And then we even took a small run, um, which may have been mentioned last time, in September preparing for this run. So this has been, there's been an enormous amount of preparation to do this. I don't know who, if you'd give one person credit for this, though. The community has really been, been thinking about this for years. Uh, but it's a real testament to the machine, um, the LHC machine folks, who really, who really um, did an amazing job making this happen when no one expected it to be done. I wouldn't say as easily. It was certainly not an easy thing, but as quickly as it was. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. Yeah, uh, we are see always your smiles very over there. <laughs> it, it, it really was amazing from our side to watch this happen. So, as we are actually trying to keep these things short and sh sweet, I think there's time for only one or two more questions. Um, I now, I, I know. I, I, 
Are you in tech Iron good question? Has a question. Yeah, I think he was having trouble with his audio, but I think it's now okay again. So maybe he can ask again. Otherwise, I will ask for him. But. So, uh, what is quark gluon plasma exactly? And what is its significance? And how and why do you think uh, it was present in the early universe? Is my question. So, um, well, uh, let's just skip that one to this, uh, the guys at the CMS Center again. Yenji? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Could you actually repeat the question? I couldn't hear it so, very well. What so, is the quark glu gluon plasma, and what is its significance for the early universe? So, so when you increase energy and increase temperature, so things get hotter and hotter. And here we not talk about temperatures we experience every day. Things that are much, much hotter than they are in the center of the sun even, so very, very hot. Then at some point, the constituents of the matter that is around us um, gets free. Probably have heard about there are quarks and gluons, and they are inside what makes up protons and neutrons, and that makes up all the matter around us. And the hotter and hotter things get, at some point, um, these get free. And that we call a quark gluon plasma. And as in the early universe, it was very, very hot because there was a lot of energy on a small volume, then also there, this quark gluon plasma has existed. And that's what we reproduce now in the experiment to study how it works. And as, as you said, that is then very important uh, to understand more how actually the universe evolved, how the Big Bang occurred. That's why we always call it, uh, call it mini bangs, what we do here. And each of the collisions, thousands and under thousands of times a second. Wow, so you're really going to the basics of how, uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I think we have time for one more question, and I propose we uh, f go to Ken, and he can also maybe first give us like the answer to the trivia question, which I think was a bit easy today because we okay. you know, got it very quickly. I understood. Cool. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, the answer came in fast on YouTube. It took about five minutes, and there was a succession of right answers. Thank you all, especially on YouTube. But the first answer was on Twitter at 11.05 Eastern Time from Chris S. Koo, who gave a complete answer to that complicated, stilted question. Simon Vandermeer and Carlo Rubia were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1984 and credited with discovery of the W and Z bosons. Congratulations. OK, is, is everybody ready here? Chris S. Koo on Twitter is about to get a team virtual hug. One. Mm. Two, three, hey, hey congratulations. Hey. Good job. OK, and back to business as usual with our regular programming. We do have a social media question for you, Freya and everybody. This time, let's turn to Facebook. Hill Britta Girl, Hill Britta Girl on the Facebook group saw a picture of us on, on the CERN Facebook page of a machine that was covered with aluminum foil. Why was that machine covered with aluminum foil, and what was it? I think this question is for Django. Over. Right. Uh, yes, the, the Lear machine has um, a very, very high, ultra high, actually, vacuum. The vacuum is necessary for the lead ions to travel in, because they are not completely stripped. They still have some electrons bound to, the, to it. And uh, when they travel in the machine, the vacuum has to be very, very good. Otherwise, more electrons would be stripped off the, the particles, and they would be lost. The, the completely stripped ions occur just uh, later in the chain. So in order to have a very, very good vacuum in the machine, before operating it, we heat the vacuum chamber with a, a coating which is called a bake-out um, bake jacket. And what you see looks like an aluminum foil. But it's actually the bake-out jacket, which allows the machine to be heated to 300 uh, degrees. That's uh, about 600 Fahrenheit. You do that for about 20 hours, and then you cool it down. And after that process, the, the vacuum can be uh, very, very good, like a 10 to the minus 12 door that's the, about 10 to the minus 15 atmosphere. Great. Well, I think that's about it for today. Um, 
I, we're always trying to also uh, answer your questions afterwards on Twitter and YouTube and Google Plus. So uh, uh, you can still expect an answer if you type something in, if, you're, if we find your answer and we, uh, have, uh, we respond to it. So it might happen. Can, can, can I, can I want to say something? Can I yeah. ask Django a question? Django is there. Uh, my, my question is, is, is this. What, what was going on in 1984? What was in these guys' heads when they gave the Nobel Prize to an accelerator guy, what were they thinking? What was all that about? Did he do something special that really helped things out for us? Well, yes. That the idea was that uh, it was at the end of a period when CERN was not hiring, and to encourage people to uh, postulate uh, for uh, for a CERN job, they decided to award the Nobel Prize to an accelerator physicist. So many people would uh, would uh, participate to the CERN job program and uh, get hired uh, from CERN. This is uh, why I applied for a CERN job in this uh, area. <laughs> We're just too late. So, so if they need new cooks, <laughs> are we going to... No, but really, he, what did he do? Can you give us a little, a little summary? Okay, yes, I can. The, yeah, yeah. What, what happened was that uh, in, uh, in the 70s, the, the first, uh, uh, the, the biggest machine at that time was the super proton synchrotron at CERN, and it was designed to provide particles uh, on, a, on a fixed target. And then there was an idea to convert this machine into a collider, to collide particles in a machine like the, like the super proton synchrotron, which has only one vacuum chamber, the LHC has two, you need to have particles colliding with other particles with the opposite charge. In other words, if you had protons in the vacuum chamber to collide them with particles going in the other direction, you needed to provide antiprotons. If you, pro if you make, if you create antiprotons the way we, we do that by colliding protons on a target, they are produced at very large angles and a very wide um, uh, energy dispersion. And if and this uh, this makes bunches which would not have the de the sufficient density for a collider to operate with a sufficient luminosity, mm -hmm. Simon van der Meer's invention allowed to pack the uh, created antiprotons in very dense bunches by uh, by a process that he invented that's called stochastic cooling. Now, I, I think if we start uh, going into uh, the description of that, it would uh, make another make room for another hangout. Uh, this we could Tell do uh, later. The but the Tell idea was that his invention allowed to um, to make antiproton beams that were dense enough for collisions in the uh, at the time uh, uh, hadron hadron collider. Uh, it was like the medium. Uh, Hadron Collider. The first Hadron Collider was the ISR, then we had the medium Hadron Collider, the SPS, and the USA, I think, at some point had a clone copy, which uh, they had to shut down a few years ago, and now we have the LHC, the large Hadron Collider. We're working on the very large Hadron Collider for uh, the, the next uh, decade, but uh, that's another story too, yeah? Yeah, I think, I think we should really also have, uh, add a nice uh, hangout actually on these matters because it is indeed very interesting. There's so much work that goes into getting these nice collisions and uh, you guys sometimes don't get all the credit you deserve. It's really very impressive the work that happens there. Thank you. Um, I propose that we uh, um, close this uh, meeting and that we uh, so say bye. So uh, I will start. Bye, everyone. Who so wants to be? Bye, bye, bye everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks for joining. <laughs> we know what bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. There it is. I see.